गुड इवनिंग ऑल माय नेम इज प्रकाश उंबरकर फ्रॉम पीडी हिंदुजा हॉस्पिटल एंड वेलकम टू ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट दिस इज अ नाइन सेशन फॉर रायन कॉन्डस कैंसर हॉस्पिटल इज वेरी गुड फॉर आईएमआरटी कोर्स एंड टुडे वी गॉट एज अ वेरी गुड एजुकेटर द नेम इज डेविड राजेस ही इज अ सीनियर रेडिएशन थेरेपिस्ट द मॉरिसिस कैंसर सेंटर at the university of california he having the very good knowledge of the field of radiation oncology and he is a delegate rcc volunteer for today's session i welcome to uh, david for this today's session and he teaching us as a image guidance radiation therapy in our radiation oncology so welcome to david uh, for this today's session and also the, all the participant request to kindly mute your microphone if you want to any ask question during your presentation kindly put your question in the chat box thank you very much mr davis please welcome thank you prakash thank you thank you um yeah like you said my name is david rojas i'm a radiation therapist at uc health san diego um so good morning good afternoon and good evening depending on where you are in the world um it's 5 am where i'm at so I'm drinking some coffee is just helping me wake up a little bit but um we're going to get started uh so this uh presentation is broken up into uh three sections okay the first section we're going to be discussing um how do you decide which modality to use whether you're doing a mv kv or cbct um, for imaging and matching purposes the second section, um, we're going to talk about IGRT, which is just uh, image guided radiation therapy. And then the third section, which we're going to spend the most time, um, there's going to be some videos. Um, some There's one video that I did myself and then other videos um, of others uh, matching um, specifically to the pelvis, because we, we do see a lot of pelvis patients, whether it's a GYN or a prostate patient. Um, but you'll see a lot of the common um, issues and faults that you see when you're doing imaging and image matching. So first section, how do you decide which imaging modality you're going to use? Um, you want to think about a few different things. Um, if you're going to be checking position, you want to make sure you're using an orthogonal pair, whether that's with the KV or MV. And we'll discuss um, some of the differences between the two. Um, you could also check and document a treatment field uh, port. You're going to use uh, the MV imaging for that. And then if you want, uh, I would say the best possible imaging to visualize soft tissue, that's going to be your cone beam CT. If you're treating any soft tissue, um, potential um, moving targets, basically. Um, so yeah, to, so first thing to check field positioning, you're going to use that um, MV or KV orthogonal pair. Um, both MV and KV imaging can visualize bony anatomy for alignment, but KV, you can see some soft tissues like uh, the carina, for example. If both are available, um, you're going to want to go with the KV. One, it's going to be better image quality, um, and it's going to be a lower dose um, for the patient. So I was thinking about that. Um, but like I said, your image quality is going to be better with, uh, with the KV. And then as far as frequency goes, um definitely for the first treatment you're gonna potentially be taking both if you're doing a 3d conformal treatment you're going to be taking that mv pair as well as your kvs for positioning um, and then it's going to be dependent on your department protocol and and um, what the doctors want as far as the frequency after that first treatment we'll talk about that a little bit as well so when you're matching um, for 2d 2d matching you need an iso pair that's going to give you that alignment in three dimensions. So it could be an, a KV ISO pair, an MV ISO pair, or um, you could do one of each, which allows you to take images without moving the gantry, since the arms for the MV and KVs are um, positioned at 90 degrees. Um, you're using bony landmarks to match the 2D images, um, which is going to translate to your table or couch um, to correct the position. Um, the imaging application contains a toolbar that um, helps with visualization of your um, image that you take. So there's different um, 
functions and software that you could use to enhance your image to you know make it you know easier on the eyes and easier to see um, when you're matching. So that includes uh, image enhancement filters, color mixing, graticule. Um, we'll go over those in a little bit more. So the MV image is sufficient to check bony anatomy. Um, and also, like I mentioned, you're going to be using an MV image to um, check a treatment field to verify MLCs. So you can see in this example, um, this is an MV image on the left here is your uh, DRR. And then your right, it's your image that you take when the patient is on the table. Um, you could see bony anatomy. You could see the lung markings. It's kind of blurry. That's basically what you're going to get with an MV image. Um, you could see the center graticule. Um, so it's still sufficient for positioning. You could um, use the graticule uh, to measure and compare um, your position. Um, and then we'll see the difference between the KV images where you could see a little more detail. The bones are still well-defined, um, but like I, like I said, in this example, you could still see soft tissue um, like the carina. So if you have, if you're matching any lung tumor or chest tumor um, that's not moving, you'll be taking a KV pair. You can make sure um, you're matching to the carina as well. This is a big exposed image, but let's say if you were treating a T-spine, where you weren't sure uh, on the level, the carina and clavicles and some soft tissue markings um, like the diaphragm as well could help you ensure that you are at the correct vertebral body. So that's another good function of uh, taking KV images. So to um, MVs to check and document the treatment field, like I mentioned, you're gonna be taking uh, an MV and image using the actual beam um, with the MLCs in place. So one, not only are you checking for positioning, you're also uh, verifying that the MLCs are going into the correct position for treatment. So that's something that we do on the first day on our, on our 3D conformal plans. Um, and then in my department, we do that um, every five days after that. So first day and every five day, five days. See a couple of things popping up on the chat. Um, Prakash, let me know if there's any questions. No. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you're doing a, an MV exposure, you wanna use a double exposure to see the surrounding background. So even though um, you're, doing an exposure to verify the treatment field, you wanna make sure that double exposure is, is what you're using to then also see surrounding anatomy to confirm that you're in the right position. So you can see here that treatment field is um, relatively small compared to the entire body. So when you do that double exposure, it's gonna open it up and also verify that you're in the correct position. All right, and then so when it comes to choosing a cone beam CT, um, this is gonna, like I said, this is gonna be your, your best tool as far as imaging goes to verify um, position in three dimensions. You're, you're gonna be able to see your soft tissue um, the best that you can. Um, most uh, cone beam CTs that we're doing in my department are for lung tumors or uh, pelvis patients that require a specific bladder fill. Um, there's any soft tissues, um, sarcomas, anything like that, um, where, you know, soft tissue is a true target, then we're going to be doing a cone beam CT. All right. So section two is, uh, what is IGRT? We talk about image matching and some, just some how to's and practical tips, um, and then image verification protocols. So go over some of the policies that you could potentially implement in your department. So what is IGRT? Image-guided image radiation therapy uses imaging to help provide an accurate um, treatment. Okay, so it's an image taken immediately prior to treatment compared to your treatment planning images. So you have your initial um, mapping or a, a setup appointment where you're um, getting ready to do the planning. 
you create that treatment planning DRR, and then your image guided radiation therapy is that image that you take prior to verify the patient's position and to adjust according to that treatment plan. So what is image matching? So image matching is a comparison of the image that you take. And here's an example where there's a color difference between the two. So the blue is the image that you take um, on that specific treatment day. And then the orange is your DRR. You're visually matching the two overlaid images. Um, the software will indicate the table shifts necessary for the patient to move to the correct alignment. So you're matching, superimposing these images. That's going to translate over to your treatment table. You apply those shifts and you should be in the correct position for treatment. Here's another example. It's kind of hard to tell in this one, um, but also there's different colors here um, to, to show the difference between the two images that um, you're comparing. But the top is before you make any shifts, you can see there's a difference between um, the spine, the, the cervical spine here. And once you make the translations, the shifts, you can see they're all minor within um, a couple of centimeters. Uh, once you correct the position, um, the images are better superimposed. And like I said, we have some videos to demonstrate that. So when it comes to um, image matching, you have different tools to help um, better visualize the image that you take. And everyone has different preferences. Um, and you know, eventually you're gonna find what, what best suits your needs and what you feel comfortable using. Um, but just know that you could adjust the contrast, the grayscale of the image. You have your digital radicule to use for reference. Um, you could do color blending, color matching, depending on what machine or software you're using, there's different colors. And then there's also filters, uh, digital enhancement filters to, to help uh, better visualize um, the image. So always keep that in mind. Um, most likely with every image you take, you're gonna be making some type of adjustment um, to make it uh, better visually. <clears throat> Another example, uh, if your planning team can add contours to your images, to your DRR, it's going to make it a little bit easier for matching purposes as well. Um, labeling the carina, the palate, the chin, the breasts, if the patient has fiducials, contouring those structures um, will help um, with image matching. Uh, the slide talks about the a 6D robotic couch. So in... I would say the best case scenario um, when you're matching, you have um, the 60 robotic couch with, which allows you to move um, in six degrees of um, motion or rotation. So we, the machine that I'm actually working on right now has the very imperfect pitch. And we do a lot of special procedures, um, SBRT, um, SRT treatments. So we're doing very small areas at very high doses. So we're doing, usually we'll start with the KV image and then go into a cone beam image. And we have this six degree couch that allows us to rotate not only our antipost, our lateral um, and um, our longitudinal, but we could also move our yaw, our roll, our pitch, um, our department has a limit of two degrees in each direction. If we have to move more than two degrees, we'll either move the patient um, or if the physicist is okay with going past two degrees, we'll re-image to verify um, the movements. So it's a great thing to have, great, um, great table to use to really refine um, your matching. So we have a question here. So when you're looking at this image, you want to think about what you can and can't see and what type of translations you can make. So what shifts um, or movements cannot be seen in this image? And then select all that apply. Prakash, do you have a, a poll to do? Yes, yes. Okay.
Okay. You guys yes. That. And you want to select all the correct answers. What <laughs> Okay, can I share result? Yeah, go for it. Yes, you can see. All right, so we're a little spread out okay. here. So yeah. this is a sagittal image. Yes. Uh, so you can see and to post. Yes. And you can see soup to inf. Yes, 15 maximum rotation. Yeah, so you can't really see left to right on a sagittal image. Got it. Um, can't really see the roll, and you can't really see the rotation. So you can see the pitch. So the correct answers for this one are things that you can't see are you can't see the left to right, you can't see the roll, and you can't see the rotation. Yes. Can uh, can you a little bit elaborate this uh, question and with answer, Mr. David? Yeah. So. Um, so you want, again, you want to think about what you, you can and cannot see, right? So this is just one image. This is why it's important to take um, an orthogonal pair. So like I said, this is a sagittal image of the pelvis. And there's actually a, a cone beam, a CVCT slice. So I think that makes it a little bit more challenging to visualize. But um, so things that you can see, the end to post, you could see the um if we were to superimpose another image the exact uh, uh another sagittal image they were off you could see that antipose potentially we can make a movement right same with soup to inf if we had another image side by side you'll be able to tell use the vertebral bodies um, other surrounding anatomy that you could potentially have a longitudinal shift okay for as far as your lateral, your left to right, when you were to superimpose this another image, you can't really see that. Okay, you can't. Um, there's nothing that is going to allow you to visualize the patient. Like if you were looking down, um, straight at the patient laying on the table, you can't see that because you're looking at the patient from the side. Um, same for the roll. Um, I would say an, an AP or um, a PA image. Is going to be best for roll or an axial. I would say it's definitely the um, what you're going to use for a roll, and uh, same for rotation. Um, and then for pitch, you could see um, if you were to impose another image, if the top of the spine was forward or back, and the bottom of the spine was forward or back, you'll see that pitch um, when comparing the images. So. There's another one. So here's a, an AP. So with those in mind, we're going to ask the same questions. What movements you cannot see in this image? You can share the result. All right. So on an AP image, um, you most people got this right. You can't see antipose on the AP image. Yes. Um, soup to inf, you can. You could still see using the vertebral bodies to make any type of longitudinal shift. Um, left to right, you definitely can. And the roll. So I would say this is kind of a trick question. Um, the correct answer is no, you can't see it. But when you look at an AP image multiple times a day, 100, 100 times a year, you'll start to see and notice different anatomy. You'll be able to visualize a roll. You won't be able to necessarily see the degree of the roll that you need to make, but you will be able to um, see that. So the correct answer is no, you can't see the roll because again, you won't be able to tell the exact degree that you need to roll it. But when you take an AP image, you will be able to notice specifically in the, in the pelvis area with the iliac crest, the sacrum, when you take a KV image, you can't see the sacrum here, or the pubic synthesis, you'll be able to visualize that the patient does have a role and you could potentially make that adjustment. You kind of have to take an educated guess on the, the degree of the role that you have to do. Um, but if you are making an adjustment to the patient on the role, you will be re-imaging to verify that you made the correct um, adjustment. Um, 
So rotation, you definitely can see that on this. Um, similar uh, structures you're gonna be looking at are the pubic synthesis, the spine, the iliac crest. You'll be able to see if there's a rotation in position. Um, pitch, you cannot really see on, um, on the AP image. Yes. All right, uh, so. so yes, yes, there is, yes, there is a two, three question for you. Okay. Can I proceed? Yeah, the question? Yeah, uh, the please elaborate more on the roll and pitch. Okay. Um, was that a question that was just asked right now or? Because I saw those earlier. Yes, uh, you can see in the chat. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we could talk about it on this slide here. So yeah, kind of yes. the same topic we've been talking about is you want to think about what you can and cannot see, right? So an AP image, um, you have your, definitely you could verify your lateral shifts, your longitudinal shifts, and your rotation. And on the lateral image, you could verify end to post, soup to inf or longitudinal, and pitch, right? So those things, when you're looking at these images, you feel very comfortable um, adjusting to the correct degree. Um, uh, the question is, is the pitch and roll under the control of the radiation therapist mm -hmm. during treatment or is it uh, machine dependent? Dependent. So both, I would say. So if you have a six degree couch, you could control um, the pitch and roll with the software and then they'll translate to the couch. If you do not have a six degree couch, then it's still gonna be dependent on you to visualize that, but then you're gonna have to make adjustments to the patient. Um, and we're gonna get into, we're gonna get into um, making those adjustments specifically with the pitch um, and some examples have the role. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about with the videos that we have coming up. So those are good, good things to think about and good questions for sure. Um, so caution with an ISO pair, the imaging software may not accurately estimate the role. So like I was saying earlier, um, even though you could visualize it on an AP image, it's not going to, you, you can't really tell the degree of the role that you really need. So the best thing to visualize a roll would be an axial image from a cone beam CT. And it says you may need to reconfirm. So like I said, and even in my department where we have a six degree couch, if our roll is um, over two degrees, um, we will either adjust the patient or we'll make the shift and then re-image to verify that we made the correct shift. Um, on a six degree couch, even though we're only moving two degrees, you can imagine um, when you're on, laying on the table, flat on the table, that two degrees could feel, feel like a big uh, slope. So um, the patient might readjust or clench or move a little bit after you make that adjustment. So re-imaging to verify that, that a shift that big um, is important. Um, so kind of along the lines that we were saying, the cone beam imaging with the 6D couch are gonna be an excellent combination and um, to get an ideal patient position. So that's gonna be your best case scenario um, using a cone beam CT with 6 d couch. If you have that luxury, great. If you don't, you can still get really good positioning um, from other imaging techniques. Um, you just have to do a little bit more manual labor um, when it comes to positioning the patient. Um, yeah, so pay attention to the magnitude of the shifts. Uh, re imaging may be a visible uh, prior to treatment. So, along those lines, um, when do you have to physically reposition the patient? So, let's say you take a KV pair or MV image and you match everything, you start looking at the spine. In this example, let's say that using the, the upper thorax, start matching the spine, the ribs, um, your carina is looking great. Um, but then you notice that the patient's arm is not in the same plane. So there's not going to be much you could do about that with your image matching. Um, so that's when you'll have to go into the room and physically move the patient. So let's say you're treating the clavicle, right? You're matching everything here. And then you notice that um, the arm is just not in the same position for whatever reason. 
you'll have to go into the room, adjust the arm accordingly, and then um, acquire a new image to verify that you made uh, the correct movement. Okay, so that's one example. Um, so same thing, kind of repeating what um, I said earlier. So if the desired couch movements or roll pitch are too large, you're gonna be uh, potentially repositioning the patient and then requiring another image um, before treatment. So things to keep in mind when you're image matching, um, you wanna be, um, you know, you wanna be quick, you wanna be speedy. Um, accuracy is still the number one uh, priority, but you gotta keep in mind that you're taking an image um, at one point in time. And even though you should be looking at your patient and hopefully you, if you have a co-pilot, you have someone that's working with you, they can help you with that while you're focused on your image matching. Um, you want to be relatively fast knowing that that time between acquiring your image and treatment, the, uh, there's potential for movement, right? So if you're dealing with a patient who's in pain or who's claustrophobic or whatever the case may be, that position might be changing um, um, during your image matching. So always keep that in mind. Um, you're still taking a still image, even with the cone beam CT, you require your image, even though it's gonna be your best tool for positioning, it's still gonna be a still image that it's not gonna be potentially 100% accurate to the current position of the patient if they're um, moving. So speed is um, something to be thinking about. A note for quality assurance, um, what assumptions are being made about the equipment and the software? So of course we take our image, or I should say we start in the room, we position the patient using um, lasers or whatever equipment you have in the room. Um, you step out, you take your image to verify position, right? And then you're applying those shifts on the software and then you're assuming that the shifts are translating correctly to the treatment table prior to giving that image. So quality assurance is important to verify that all the equipment in the room and with image matching software is um, operating appropriately and to a specific tolerance. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. Um, QA should be performed daily to validate the alignment of imaging equipment and table. Uh, physics provides guidance with that and there's different tools, phantoms to use um, software to verify that everything's working accordingly. Um, and this, again, this is something that you're doing on a daily basis. So developing your own imaging policies, things to consider. Um, how often are you gonna be taking these images? Are you gonna do it daily? Um, are you gonna do it um, every other day, weekly, right? So the doctor's gonna determine uh, your imaging frequency uh, and it's gonna indicate it in, that, in the prescription. Okay, you'll develop department protocols and depending on the treatment site, um, you know, a daily image or a, every other day or every third day, um, it's gonna be appropriate. Uh, the frequency image should be at least once a week. Okay, I would say at the first day of treatment and at least once a week. Um, daily imaging may be preferable for regions where the greater anatomical variability and regions where critical structures are nearby. And then you may consider ad hoc imaging uh, if setup is uncertain. So let's say you have an established protocol where you image the first day and then you're only supposed to image the third or fifth day. If for whatever reason, the second day, you feel like the patient position might not be um, appropriate, then you have that as needed imaging, right? So, um, as a therapist, you're going to be using your best judgment on whether or not you an image should be taken to verify position. Establishing um, a shift tolerance. So like I mentioned, in my department, our shift tolerance is two degrees. That um, goes for our lab, lateral and longitudinal and antipost translations as well. Um, so we're staying within two, two CM or two degrees um, with our shift tolerance. So if we go over that, um, we will most likely um, re-image to verify those shifts. 
So when do you require an image to be repeated, um, either prior to treatment or every fraction? So things to think about. Um, and then at what tolerance must you consult the physicist or physician, right? So if you have a really big shift on, um, on a patient, but you believe that it's an appropriate shift, it's always good to you know, verify with your physicist or your physician that they agree that you're making the correct shift, right? So these are just some of the examples of the shift tolerances. Um, a 3D conformal plan you'll see in general has slightly bigger tolerances than an IMRT or VMAP plan. Um, they're still all relatively small though. So keeping in mind that um, as the shifts get uh, larger, you're, there's more degree of variability as far as the patient position goes. So things to keep in mind when you're making large shifts whether it's re-imaging or verifying with a, a doctor or a physicist. See some questions popping up. Yes, yes. There is one question. Uh, I was thought that you can only limit the pitch and roll when it is above the presence value of three degree according to variant medical system. Same with electa. Yeah, so I believe on a, on a variant true beam, the pitch and roll has a three degree max. So if you are, um, I don't have experience on, a, on the Electa machine. I've, I've only used an Electa a few times, but I know for the true beam that we use in my department, we have a max of three degrees that the machine or the table is actually physically capable of doing. Um, but our department protocol is two degrees on what we allow for um, for shifts. There is times, depending on where we're treating, whether it's we believe it's something that's um, solid, like a some type of bony structure, where if we're doing, um, let's say, an SBRT and in the T spine or L spine, and we see a big roll. We might apply a 2.5 degree roll, but the physicist would, uh, would require us to re-image to verify that roll. So we'll apply the shift, re-image, make sure that looks good, and then proceed with the treatment. Um, I see another question here, is KV better result than MV? Um, we covered this earlier. I would say yes, it's definitely a better result because not only is a KV image going to give you um, better image quality because it's going to... Um, Continuate better with bony anatomy. Um, it's also going to be less dose for the patient. So if you're doing imaging daily, um, that's things to keep in mind. Is um, if you have that capability of doing KV imaging, that's what you're going to want to go for. So, uh, the, Mr. David, what is the uh, the recommendation in the CBCT? If you uh, the role is a two degree or two point five degree. So, what is the exactly value we have to risk? They were the setup. What is your recommendation? So um, I would say that's that's something that you know it might vary from department from department. Like I said, in in my department, we have a, a when I'm operating the machine, I know that I can't go past two degrees. But for for whatever reason, if I feel like I need to go past that, um, depending on where we're treating the situation, I might have to go back into the room and adjust the patient or like I said if um, if we're doing so some of our let's for example we have SBRT treatments stereotactic treatments on lung tumors and we acquire a cone beam CT uh, we potentially see a role there um, if I am um, if I'm going to apply uh, let's say a 2.5 role on a soft tissue lung tumor um, if the physicist is okay with doing that, knowing that potentially there's not a lot of movement, we will apply those shifts, but then we will re-image to verify that the, the shift was correct. Um, if it needs something bigger than that, then again, we would have to go into the room and, and physically move the patient. That's one example though. Um, I think it, it's very, it's going to vary um, on the, the area of treatment. Um, so I think using your best judgment is, is going to be the way to go. I would say two degrees, though, is is a good um, 
standard practice. So um, that's something that our physicists are comfortable with, anything less than two degrees. Um, but still, even if you're at two degrees or even a little bit less, um, if you aren't 100% confident that the shifts were applied correctly or the patient might have moved, then that's when you will acquire a new image. Okay. And one more additional question in your slide. Shift also sometimes different with how we select clip blocks, area of interest, and how do you minimize these shifts? That is, a, is talking about the area of interest. Uh, shifts also, let me see. Um, I'm not sure if I understand that question. Um, shifts also may differ with how you select the cliff box. Area of interest, how do we minimize the shifts? Um, I'm not sure if I understand that question. We'll ask Mr. Krishna Bhagat. Um, sorry, um, my question is: uh, We are doing now uh, CVCT. Okay. Sometimes we select the area of interest, larger area, to matching. For matching, it it gives a slightly different uh, shift. If I select less area that uh, for matching, that is called clip box selection. Okay. Yeah, it gives different values. So which so is correct. Are, so are you, are you talking about like auto matching? Yeah, like auto matching, we, we do the CVCT. Before that, we have fixed the clip box, uh, that area of interest where we match. If gotcha. I go a bit larger, it gives different uh, values. If I reduce that area, it gives a different values. So yeah. which which should we select? That's um yeah, okay, I understand now. Thank you for your question. Um that's something that I would say is common with the imaging software um in any department. So if you're doing using auto match on a cone beam, um, I would say it is best practice to you know define your area of interest within the treatment area. So I'll just use a spine example. If you're treating, um, a, let's say L2 through L5, so a good chunk of the lower spine, you would, I would say it's best practice to define that area of interest to okay. the L2 and L5 with, with um, some margin around that, and then see what the auto match gives you. Um, I would say that's going to give you the best position. Some some may practice with um, using the entire image, right? Which is, I think it's okay, appropriate, and you're gonna get different values because potentially you're gonna have more movement with the surrounding anatomy. Um, so I think keeping in mind, depending on the area of interest that you're using, slight shifts in different directions are expected as long as your treatment area is what um, it's matched appropriately, then that's gonna be the goal. Right. So I think depending on where you're treating, moving that cliff box or that area of interest um, is probably going to have to be adjusted. Right. So it's not going to be the same for every every situation. Yes. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. I think I'm going to keep going here. Yes, yes. All right, so this is this is a fun part. Okay, we get to do some image matching. We're gonna look at some videos, um, and some of the things that I like to look at when I'm looking at images. So this first one here, uh, I'm just gonna let it play, kind of talk over it. Um, but this is a uh, KV orthogonal pair uh, in the uterine neck. So. You could see uh, the, the therapist that's operating is acquiring a lateral image at the top and then an AP image at the bottom. Um, I want you guys to pay attention to the different um, uh, software the toolbar has here. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but where it says highlight, that's going to be your filters to select from. Uh, the content filter is going to be uh, 
Um, I would say the most common filter used, and I believe in this video, they also use a content filter. So you'll be able to see the difference between your first image that you acquire. And then when you change your filter to content, the image jumps out at you a little bit more, right? So you see more detail um, in your image and that's gonna help with positioning. Okay, there's different ways to do your image matching. Okay, this um, therapist is showing, looking at a little um, screen, a little box. In that box is your DRR. So you're moving, essentially you're moving the DR around the image, fine tuning your position. And okay, that's one way to do it. The Graticule is turned on here. So you could use your Graticule um, to verify position as well. Um, you would need to toggle back and forth between the DRR and the image you take. On the left side here, you could see your couch shifts as you're making adjustments. So right now, there's only a 0.3 cm and a 0.23 uh, lat adjustment. And then as they're making their antipost, um, you could see there's a 0.65. So all within um, one centimeter of, a, um, of movement. Okay, so they're just showing different examples with color blending, different um, tools that you could use um, for matching, right? So um, if you're newer to these softwares, you know, find what works best for you, right? So um, I personally like to use this crosshair here. So this crosshair where depending on where you move it, you could see the DRR and your image um, at the same time. And using these straight lines that the crosshair provides um, really allows you to um, superimpose the image, right? And you're getting a good amount of information from both, right? Um, so that's just an example of that. Um, what else does this video show? So just going over the different things. All right, so this next video is uh, one of mine. This is uh, I'm matching on a GYN pelvis patient. So in this uh, specific patient, she has a long treatment field um, that goes up her lower spine and is in her pelvis. We acquire um, upper and lower KV images and orthogonal pair. And then for her, we do a comb beam CT because we're, this is, we're treating uh, with a VMAT technique. And there's a high dose area that, I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell in this image, but there's a high dose area targeted to one of her pelvic lymph nodes. So I'm just showing you guys our, uh, my KV matching, and I'm gonna let it play. Um, I'll talk over a little bit, but basically this is me matching in real time. So you can kind of get an idea of the speed that I'm matching, what I'm looking at um, as I'm making these um, adjustments. So right now the machine is moding up. I like to switch my filter before I take my image, just because I know I'm going to use the content filter. So I switch the content filter. Um, I am moving my imaging, uh, my imager to the correct position. Anytime I'm doing an upper and lower image, I prefer to start with the upper image. And if I can, for this example, I try to include the entire treatment um, area in the superior portion but then also try to visualize a little bit of the lower area with the pelvis. So I like to use the swipe, looking at both images um, back and forth. And then, like I said, I use my crosshair to make minor, smaller adjustments using the straight lines um, with the crosshair. So in this specific patient, I'm using the spinous process, the pedicles on the, on the spine, the iliac um, crest and pelvic rim. That's what I'm really looking at. The antipost, I'm using the vertebral bodies to line up the anterior and posterior um, uh, vertebral processes. Let me pause that for a second. So in this scenario, I made some shifts and um, there was a little wiggle. It's kind of hard to tell, but if you look at the um, AP image, her spine is not perfectly straight like it was in the DRR, right? So you see a little rotation there. Um, so we actually went into the room and adjusted because such, since it's such a long image, I could adjust the upper part to make it look good, but 
I'm going to be taking lower images, most likely that lower part is not going to adjust the correct way. So I knew that going into it. So I we adjusted her, uh, her shoulders. And in this case, I think I moved her shoulders to her left, knowing that I need a straight spine. I want to get that as close as possible to the DRR, knowing that in a, in a moment, I'm going to be taking lower images. Um, and that's going to affect my positioning um, when I'm doing the matching on the upper images. So same deal here. I take my image. I like to look at big picture, make sure we're within the ballpark of the treatment area. Um, and then I'm using that crosshair to make minor adjustments. So again, I'm looking at the spinous process, the pelvic rim. So you can see I'm moving my crosshair around to give me those straight lines at where I'm looking. So where I'm putting those straight lines on the crosshair, that's where my eyes are making those adjustments. Okay, so I made those shifts. Let me see where we were at. We were all um, shifts within one centimeter or less. Okay, and now I'm gonna make um, the move on the imager to take the lower image. So just showing that here, moving the imager down to include the entire, um, treatment area, and you can see on the right side here that the images are gonna be superimposed. So I'm not gonna be missing any of the anatomy. Um, I take a quick look. There's a little bit of movement, but nothing significant. I do make a and to post adjustment here, knowing that at the top, there is gonna be some movement, but I made a point to a two millimeter adjustment there. Um, like I mentioned, for this patient, we do a cone beam CT. Um, that's going to give me my best uh, uh, positioning uh, image, right? And like I mentioned, she has a high dose lymph node area. And I've treated this patient multiple times already. And I know that that, that high dose lymph node area um, does move. So your bony anatomy is one thing, right? But when you're treating, in this example, GYN, um, the uterus and pelvic lymph nodes, those are soft tissue structures. So your cone beam CT is going to be your best match. I'm going to pause for a second. I don't know if there's any questions with all that. I know I kind of went fast talking through that. Someone said you can also mm -hmm. contour the anatomy for easy matching. That's very true. Contours are our best friends. We like contours. All right, I'm gonna keep going here. Yes, yes. So this is just another example of um, a KV orthogonal pair. So same deal, you take the image. I'm gonna kind of click through this one. You take your image. You change the filter. The uh, person here operating decided to change the filter on the DRR, which that's another option. You could change the filter on your um, your DRR if you choose. Okay, and you start matching. Like I said, you could do different different ways to to match. If the person chooses to use a smaller square. You can move it around, make minor adjustments. You're looking at the pelvic rim, the iliac crest any bony landmarks that are easy to see and compare when you're looking at your lateral, the sacrum is really good to look at to make any and to post adjustments. One thing I do wanna mention that um, in this video they don't do is when you're using these smaller tools, whether it's this square box or the crosshair that you saw me using, I would say it's best practice to look at the image um, big picture. So turn that off, turn off that small square or turn off the crosshair and then use your slide bar to look at the image in, in its entirety, right? So even though let's say they make an adjustment here in that small square, that looks good, but you don't know how that affected the rest of the image, right? You wanna verify that the shifts that you made um, are the correct shifts for the treatment. So I would say it's best. I would say it's best practice to to look at the image in its entirety um, before you apply the shifts and do the treatment. 
So keep going here. This is an example of a field verification using MV imaging. So like I mentioned, you're, you're gonna be um, acquiring uh, MV double exposure to verify treatment fields to verify that the MLCs are going into the correct position for treatment. So you'll see this double exposure here. First image is taken of the treatment area. Okay, and then the second exposure is taken of the surrounding anatomy. So you could also verify position, little movement there, but not nothing too crazy within the treatment field. Um, you verified that the MLC is moved into place with that treatment port. Okay, same, same example here. You take your treatment field. So again, this image is being acquired with your treatment beam. So these MLCs are in the correct position as far as the treatment field goes. Um, see some things popping up in the chat here. Look. Yes, there is a, a two question, David. Yep. If you taking more KV, CBCT image prior of treatment, is the imaging dose added the final treatment dose? And the second question is, uh, what are the purpose of margin in CBCT auto match toolbox. So what? Okay. So good questions. Um, yes. So. But the the physicists are going to be the ones that are you know tracking our, our total dose and any type of imaging is always taken into account. So whether we're doing daily KVs or daily CBCTs, um, that's something that's going to be taken into account. In our department, we kind of have, uh, a, I would say it's an unwritten rule. If we have to do, um, we, we try to keep it no more than three cone beams within a day. Um, and that happens sometimes when it comes to, okay, that's why we like to take our KV pair prior to doing a cone beam, because that's going to minimize any large potential shifts that you have when you first take a, a CV, right, you'll be able to visualize that, um, uh, bony anatomy first, make your adjustments, acquire your cone beam, and hopefully those adjustments that you make, you made on those bony anatomy, um, are pretty good. Cool. You acquire that cone beam, so if you are just with them, um, then that's okay. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if you can mute whatever is in the background. Yeah. Uh, There's two minutes, two minutes, David. Yeah, Maram, Warda, can I tell you all the things that I've been doing? Um... And then what was the other question? Sorry. Uh, oh, what was the purpose on the margin on the cone beam auto match? So I would say that's so similar to a double exposure, right? So you have your treatment area and then you have the surrounding anatomy. Your treatment area is going to be your area of interest and what you want to look at. Um, but that added margin is going to help you um, potentially with glitching. It may or may not though, depending on where you're treating, right? So if you want to define that area of interest to the actual treatment site, go for it, see what that auto match gives you. If you feel comfortable with that match, then great, right? But if you think you need more information, that's where you'll add that margin with the surrounding anatomy. And that's gonna be site specific for sure. All right, so I'm gonna keep going here. So there's just an, an example of um, fiducials. So some uh, specifically prostate patients, we have some, uh, uh, we some liver uh, tumors that have fiducials in my department. Uh, fiducials are a great thing for us because especially when you're treating any soft tissue uh, tumors that potentially move, uh, fiducials are a good way to do it. So let's say your department doesn't have the capability of doing a cone beam CT or your practice is to only do a cone beam CT um, once a week. If the patient has fiducials, you feel pretty confident that you're matching to the correct um, anatomy, right? So in this example here, they took an MV image on a prostate patient, but they have fiducials. So 
it's kind of hard to tell in the video, but you could you could see that they're contoured in the green here. So the fiducials are contoured. They took an image um, and they chose to do an, uh, an AP and an oblique, which um, you know it's going to give you two different uh, degrees of visualization of the anatomy. Um, I would say a lateral is probably best, but they probably took an oblique because the lateral um, image is going to have more uh, bony anatomy in the way of the fiducial. So that's probably why they chose to do the oblique. Um, but you could see when they match to the fiducials, the bony anatomy um, does not match. And that's something that is probably expected when it comes to a prostate treatment, right? Um, prostate is soft tissue. You have different bladder filling, rectum filling, filling. So when you match to fiducials that are implanting in the prostate, you feel confident that you're you're treating appropriately. So I wanted to show that example. So the following slides are examples of troubleshooting and repositioning of a patient. So something that you um, you're going to see that are some common issues when positioning within the pelvis area. Um, so in this example here, I'm going to let it play, but you'll see they're looking at a lateral image. Um, there's a big pelvic tilt. Okay, so a couple things to do. You could start matching and kind of give you an idea of how much, what degree of tilt you're looking at. Okay, so if you have a six degree couch, you have potentially the option to adjust that tilt on a six degree couch. If you do not have that option, you're going to have to move the patient. So in this specific example, um, looking at it, it looks like you can kind of see in the very beginning, the patient's spine needs to come more anterior compared to the DRR, um, or the sacrum or the pubic symphysis needs to come down more posterior um, compared to the DRR. So one way to do that is you could go back into the room and ask the patient to um, arch their lower back a little bit or relax and or relax their, their legs. Or if you have anything underneath their legs, you wanna make sure that one, it's in the correct position. If you're using back locks or sponges or whatever you guys use for positioning, that they're in the correct position for the treatment as far as how they were set up initially. Um, so making adjustments to devices is something that you could potentially do, um, asking the patient to make that movement. Let's say if you ask the patient to, in this example, you ask the patient to arch the lower back, um, but they're not able to hold it or they arch it and it's not enough, then in my department, um, we're okay with using um, sheets to place under their lower back. So we'll put just like a regular um, thin uh, table sheet. We'll fold it and then we'll place it in their lower back to help arch and push the spine forward um, in this specific scenario. Um, I would say it's best practice to try to make adjustments to any specific devices that the patient is simulated with first. Make sure everything's positioned correctly. Um, but sometimes you run into situations where, you know, the patient on simulation day, um, they're a little more nervous, right? They're a little more tense. Um, they have one position on that day. And then when they come in for treatment, they're either more nervous or more tense, right? Or just they maybe relax a little bit and the position is going to be different, right? So that's when you'll, you'll have to start making those adjustments. Um, I see someone raise their hand. Uh, it just says Zoom users. I don't know who that is. Let me see what the chat box says. Okay, just talking about the noise. All right, hopefully that makes sense here. Um, another example here, I'm gonna let it play. So looking at the image, kind of clicking through, looking at the AP. All right, so this is why I like using the sidebar to better visualize your entire anatomy and image. Um, so you see that there's a rotation and actually a little bit of a roll. So like I mentioned earlier, using your AP image, even though you can't tell the degree of roll, you could, you could see that there's a roll there. So 
in the pelvis, I like to use um, the sacrum and the pubic symphysis to verify a role. And you can also use the pedicles of the spine and the spinous process. Um, with practice, you could really, you could tell the difference um, on which direction uh, the patient needs to be rolled. Um, for the pubic symphysis, for example, uh, you know that the pubic symphysis is more anterior than the sacrum. So when you're comparing the two, it looks like this patient needs to roll to the right a little bit, right? So again, you can't really tell the, the, the degree of the roll, but you could tell that there is a roll there. So this is something that if you don't have a six degree couch, you're gonna go in and physically roll the patient um, in the correct, correct, uh, correct position. This is something that will come with practice when you, when you take multiple images, you start to see that adjustment. This patient also has a slight rotation. The iliac crests are really good um, anatomy to, to look at as far as the patient goes and also the pelvic rim. Right. This is just another example here. So when you're treating a long portion of the spine, you can see that there's movement here, right? So just by looking at it, it looks like this movement is gonna be over two degrees and such is such a long treatment field. You could try to match the very top of the image, right? But that's gonna affect the very um, inferior, the bottom of the image. Right, so this is a, a, an example of where you'll potentially have to go back into the room and adjust the patient accordingly. So looking at this image, that's your DRR, right? That's your DRR there. And in a moment, it'll pop up. This is your image that you take prior to treatment. So you're looking at the two. It looks like the patient needs to go to the left if, we're, if this is an AP image. You're gonna pull the shoulders to the left um, and try to match appropriately, okay? This one, so that's that image. So this was after the adjustment here. You can see on the AP image, everything's matching up really nicely now. And on the lateral image, and to post, looks like everything's matching up really nicely. You do a quick swipe to visualize the entire anatomy, make sure everything's looking good. And then you proceed with treatment. Here's another example. So in this one, you could see there's another um, pitch issue here. Pelvic pitch is something that is very common. Um, like I said, there's different factors that go into it. Um, it could be the positioning devices that you're using. It could be the patient's clothes, right? They're wearing different clothes potentially from their mapping appointment to their treatment. Um, and then the patient can be clinching or too relaxed, right? So it's something that pops up um, frequently, as some of you may know. Right, so in this scenario, it looks like if you look at this box here, this top image that I'm um, pointing at is your image that you took um, prior to treatment, and then the small square is your DRR. You can see there's an antipost movement that needs to happen there. Um, pretty sure they went, they looked down at the bottom near the sacrum. That was matching up appropriately, but see the pelvic um, rim and the sacrum was looking good but not the spine. So in this scenario, you could either ask the patient to relax their lower back and try to flatten out their lower back on the table, um, or you could lift the legs up a little bit, whether they have something underneath their legs, you could push it up underneath their legs a little bit more and that'll help them raise the sacrum and the pubic symphysis. And hopefully that gets you in um, the correct region. All right, so those are a couple of examples. Example four, I believe there's a roll here. We're clicking through, this, this therapist is using the pelvic rim to visualize any type of movement. 
<clears throat> this patient has the ducials also. Using the sacrum. So looks like they're going to look at the image in its entirety. So this is another example where you could see that this patient has a role. You can't tell that the degree of the role, but like I said, I like to look at the putic synthesis compared to the sacrum. That's gonna tell you what direction you need to go, right? So when you're looking at both images, it looks like this patient needs to roll to the right, right? So with practice, you'll be able to know how much you need to um, roll the patient. And I believe this might be the last example. So this example here is another example of pelvic pitch. Quite a bit of pelvic pitch on this one. All right, you could tell this patient's very lordotic, so pitch is going to be an issue. When it's something this significant, even if you have a six degree couch, you're not going to be able to adjust it, right? So um, this is a scenario where you'll have to go into the room and adjust the patient. So looking at this, it looks like the lower half, the legs need to come forward, right? Or, and or, I should say, the, the spine needs to go more posterior and back towards the table. So same thing, you could either um, add something underneath the patient's legs to push the pubic synthesis and pelvis, the inferior pelvis forward, um, or you can ask the patient to relax and lower their lower, um, lower back towards the table. So like I said, this is something that's very common. So with practice, you'll start to know um, how the adjustments need to be made and at what degree. All right, I think that's it. So your next session is next week. It's gonna be session 10, um, IGT image matching workshop. So thank you guys for having me. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yes, I'll... thank you, David. Uh, there is a two, three question in the chat box. Yeah. Does the sacrum always match perfectly considering the fact that is movable joint? Um, I would say for the most part, yes. Right. So you like you saw in those examples, um, when there's a pitch, you can match the sacrum perfectly, but potentially the lower spine doesn't match or vice versa. Um, but for the most part, it's a, it's a reliable and stable landmark um, to use for matching. Okay. And one more question uh, in the chat box, we can see which one is the best filter to choose for the appropriate image registration? So I would say the content filter is, is the most popular, right? You could, there's several different options and that's on the variant systems. Electa might have different options, um, but um, for me personally, I prefer the content filter. And I feel like that's a, a popular filter to use. I think we're actually in my department, we're getting a software upgrade from Varian where they're gonna make the content filter or they're gonna give us the option to make filter a specific filter our default filter. So my department is actually gonna make the content filter the default filter now. So we don't have to adjust that every time we take an image. So looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> so one more question for you. Uh, just what is what is we apply pitch for this that scenario? Uh, what was what was the question again? Sorry. Zoya Khan. So you can see in the chat what is. What is we apply? Uh, it's, it's, those three was probably asking for a specific um, example. Uh, um, Zoya, can you um, elaborate? Or I don't know if you had your question. question answered already. Ms. Zoya? Okay. In the prostate patient, can we take vessel as a reference to the match prostate as it uh, 
it is movable organ um yeah i mean yeah you can but that's going to be something that you'll visualize on a cone beam ct so using using the seminal vesicles is potentially part of the area of interest if they're treating that within the treatment plan um but like i said the only way to visualize that is going to be on a cone beam ct so you you'll have plenty of information to to look at um mm -hmm. when i'm looking at a prostate patient on a cone beam ct um we have the PTV, the contours turned on of the treatment area, your bladder fill, your rectum fill, gas, right? That's all going to play a position um, um, in the actual patient position, right? That's also going to play a part in the positioning. So um, our protocol for our prostate patients is to have a full bladder and empty rectum. You know, they patients try their best to, to match what they did in their mapping scan. Um, but that's something that we verify with the cone beam CT image um, prior to every treatment. So we give them the instructions to drink their water. Um, they do their best, but we still verify to make sure that it's um, according to the treatment plan. Okay. And David, I have one question because many times we treat in the pelvis patient with CS cervix or we see the, the longer field. So okay. pelvis and the parotid node also if you want to treat. So longer in the CBCT, we can see in the variant, as of now in the variant, there is facility extended CBCT. Right. But those are uh, the hospital or the department, there is no facility for extended CBCT. We, uh, that scenario, we take the CBCT only the lower or upper part we take. Right. But if you see the, the more than the degree, uh, 2.5 degree. So that scenario, so how tackle this situation? Because entire shift, we can see the uh, the entire the spine and the pitch if we apply. So how tackle this problem? That yeah, that's that's a, a good question. Um, I think that's why it's important to take a KV image if you have that option, right? To take that KV image, because potentially you're gonna have to take multiple images. Um so if you don't if you don't have the option to do an extended cone beam, you're gonna be relying on those KV images, right? So that's gonna be um, your go-to and you're gonna to have to use your best judgment, even though on the KV images you're matching to bony anatomy. Um, once you acquire your cone beam CT, you have to know that, okay, you already made a, a perfect match on bony anatomy. When you acquire your cone beam CT, even though your field of view is gonna be potentially limited, you feel confident in that the KV match was good. And as you're looking through that cone beam image, um, hopefully everything's within um, the target, right? And if it's not, then I would go back to the KV images, try to make the adjustment accordingly, and then and then reacquire that cone beam CT. Okay, that that it's a tough scenario when you don't if you don't have the option to do an extended cone beam for sure. Right, so that that's that's where software could potentially hold hold you back, um, but I think using the the two hand in hand, using the KV and the CBCT is going to be your your best option. Hopefully, in future, the longer uh, we can cover up area. Yeah. yeah Next exactly. development, we can say. Yep. And one more question as uh, related to imaging dose in reference to daily imaging. How do you into take consideration for the dose from the CBCT or MVKV imaging? Does it has effect of the prescribed dose? So already, I think you. Would... Yeah, so that's that's definitely something for a physicist to to discuss, right? There, our physicists are the ones that are keeping track of the total dose, the daily dose, right? And what at what degree is that going to affect um, the total dose at the end of the treatment? Um, like I mentioned earlier, for us, if we're acquiring imaging, um, whether it's KVs or MVs, we we practice ALARA, which for us, I don't know if ALARA, if you guys understand ALARA, but ALARA is as low as reasonably achievable, right? So that's, yes. you want to achieve your perfect image matching, but with as little images as possible, right? Because that's knowing that you're giving more dose to the patient, right? Um, right. So. If I'm doing um, a cone beam CT um, daily, 
our best practice for us is we limit it to three in a day. If we take one image and we see there's a positioning error, we make an adjustment, we take another image and it's still not a good positioning and we take our third image, we know that, okay, this is our last chance. If we get the positioning um, on this one, then we're good to go. But if not, then we'll actually, depending um, on where we're treating and with the doctor's approval, we will cancel that treatment for the day and just restart the next day, right? So that's something to keep in mind because you don't want to just keep giving dose to the patient, keep trying to reacquire an image if for whatever reason you're not going to be successful. Um, but that is something that your physicist um, should be um, aware of and keeping track of for the total dose. Okay. And one more additional, uh, the question, what is the purpose of TKG triple phase CT for liver and the gallbladder patient? I think. So I believe that's like a, a, a gating type of question. So for the liver and the gallbladder, I know in my yeah. department, we acquire um, a 4D scan with, to track um, patient motion, right? So in our treatments, when we're doing liver and gallbladder treatments, um, those are stereotactic treatments and there's gating involved, right? To measure the degree of motion um, while the patient is breathing. Um, and then when it comes to the actual treatment, we are um, doing a, a KV match. We're doing a cone beam match. And then if the uh, physicists and planning team determine there's a, a large degree of motion during bre the breathing cycles, um, we do a live fluoro also. So in most cases, a liver or gallbladder has fiducials. So when you acquire a fluoro image, it's a, essentially a live KV image you should be able to see fiducials and you'll be able to track the movement and motion uh, during the breathing cycle. And that's something that um, we're able to track. Okay. So again, and that's something that I would say is very, is common, more common towards um, SBRT, like higher, um, higher dose, smaller target area treatments. Um, where, you know, you want to make sure you hit that target. Got it. So, so as a, as a IGRT application, when you're delivering the, the treatment, the radiation therapist is very big role because nowadays the world is changing, technology also changing. The day-to-day uh, -day as a radiation therapist is a more responsible person because if you see, if you verify, then we can treat. Correct? Um, yes, that's that's very true. Um, even now in today's world with, with AI and automation, um, there's nothing like the human eyes to verify something. So as you as some of you probably know, when you do you're using AutoMatch, the AutoMatch software is not going to be a hundred percent guaranteed every time, right? So you know, as a as a radiation therapist, you have that responsibility to make sure that you know you're matching and treating the patient accordingly, right? So that image matching is 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 very important, right? Because at the end of the day, we're the ones that in control of delivering that radiation. And you want to make sure that radiation goes to the correct place. So um, as you guys have more experience with image matching and, and patient positioning, um, you'll build that confidence in making sure that you're, you're treating the patients accordingly. Uh, looks like Victor raised his hand. Yes. Yeah, I, I did. I, I asked a question earlier, but I I don't know if that's what's addressed because uh, my network was bad. I've been back and forth. I asked a question about uh, if you are matching a pendulous breast, how do you, what's the best practices when you're doing that? Because uh, from my experience here, yeah, today the breast is one way, tomorrow is the other way. Yeah. So what do you do in cases like that? Yeah, so um, great question. Um, when it comes to, to breast imaging, you, you have to keep in mind that 
breast the soft tissue, right? So in my department, um, we, we use a combination of different imaging, depending on if we're doing tangent fields, we're doing uh, a three field with the superclav um, treatment field. Um, we'll use KV imaging or, and then also verify with MV fields. So for example, in a three field, we'll start with a uh, AP or PA image, right? So we'll take an image of the upper thoracic area. We will match to bony anatomy, right? Making sure the arm and the superclav area is matching, that the spine, and especially the cervical spine near the superclav area is matching. Um, and then we'll apply those shifts. And then to verify the, the depth, because on an AP image, you don't know, you can't verify your treatment depth. We will take our MV imaging to verify that depth, right? So there's still potential for adjustments that need to be made based off a, a tangent oblique image. Um, so if you're not in a good depth, once you take your MVs, you might potentially have to move the patient, whether it's a patient role um, or some type of other adjustment based on the, the breast alignment, right? In my department, we thankfully have um, a software um, called AlignRT, right? That's surface guided um, software that tracks um, surface anatomy. So we use that in conjunction with imaging to verify um, our breast patients. Some of our breast patients are treated with an, a VMAT or RMRT technique. And in those scenarios, we're doing a cone beam CT to, to visualize um, the soft tissue or the breast, because with uh, IMRT or VMAT plans, you have that those tighter margins. Um, so you need to make sure that your match um, is appropriate. So like we mentioned earlier, that cone beam CT is gonna be your, your best option. Hopefully that okay. answers your question. Yeah, will that, will that equally be the same case if you are equally matching a, a sarcoma with a soft tissue swelling, would you? Will you do the same thing? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, any any type of soft tissue um, uh, tumor or target area, you know, your your best practice is going to be your cone beam, right? But that's also dependent on your treatment technique, right? So if you're using a VMAT or IMRT plan, knowing that your margins are a lot closer, your treatment area is going to be well defined to your target. Um, your matching is going to be that much more important. Okay. If you're using a 3D conformal plan where, you know, margins are a little bit more forgiving, um, you might still be, uh, be able to get away with just doing an MV or KV uh, match, knowing that um, you have a little bit more margin to, to work with, with your, um, your treatment fields, right? So if you have the option to do the cone beam CT, that's going to be your best option. If you don't, then you rely on your KV imaging um, and you make your best judgment as far as positioning goes. Thank you. Any other participant, any question? Hello. Yes, please. All right. Uh, can can you tell me about the difference between IMRT and the IGRT? Okay. If I if I do uh, a, if I do a daily image to IMRT, became to IGRT or not? I want to know about the difference. So so IMRT is um, intensity modulated ra radiation therapy or a VMAT treatment plan. So that's where the, the beam is being uh, modulated by the, the treatment fields, by the MLCs in the machine. Okay. Uh, so that's a different treatment technique. Um, mm -hmm. And then IGRT is what we're, is a, what stands for image guided radiation therapy, meaning that you're imaging prior to delivering your treatment. Okay. So they're in a way they're different. One's an imaging technique and one um or sorry, a treatment technique, and one is um a treatment practice or um imaging prior to treatment. 
imagine prior treatment is IGRT. Correct. Image guided radiation correct? therapy. All right. Okay. 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 If if I, if I do a IGRT treatment before I deliver the treatment, I'm taking the image and superimpose and matching and correct the uh, values and treat. Is it, it is IGRT. That's IGRT. That's correct. Right. If I if I if I do it to the IMRT, it automatically come into the IGRT technique. Um, yeah. So you could. So like I said, IMRT is a, a treatment technique um, yeah. when it comes to the planning side of delivering the treatment and the radiation. So IMRT is more comparable to like a three D conformal treatment. So there's one where. <clears throat> A 3D conformal is using the, the MLCs in static fields, where yeah. okay. in IMRT, you have um, the MLCs moving and delivering the beam, modulating the beam during the treatment. Most of the time, those are in fields that where the gantry is moving itself. All right. All right. Uh, so the, uh, in the IGRT, the uh, ML design, the, uh, Fixed positions. What was that? Sorry. Oh, okay. No, I am IMRT is a moving and treating. Right. Yeah. Okay. IMRT, uh, IGRT is imaging and then treatment. Right. Yeah. So in the IGRT, if, if the if the plan has uh, four or five fields, yep. For one patient, uh, each fields we should have to take images. Um, I would say yes and no. So no, if you're doing, let's say just a KV or MV orthogonal pair to correct the patient position. Mm -hmm. uh, but then potentially you're going to do MV um, double exposure images at each treatment field to verify that the MLCs are um, going to according to the treatment plan. So that's something that in my department, we practice on the first day of treatment. If we're doing a 3D conformal plan, we'll, we'll take a KV imaging mm -hmm. to verify patient position and make adjustments accordingly. And then we'll do, right. and then we'll take MV double exposure images at each treatment field. But by then your patient position should be already set. So now you're just, um, taking images to verify the MLCs. All right. You, you are checking every field in every angle. That's, yeah, in my department, For we, the first do day. That, we do that on the very first day of treatment to verify oh. each treatment field. After that, we do- It is four. We do it one- is four. Go ahead. It is for IGRT. You, you, you said you, you are checking. It is for IGRT. Oh, I am. Yeah, so I think, I don't know if you're getting the two terms confused, but IGRT is just image guided radiation therapy. Yeah. So regardless of the treatment technique, whether it's a 3D conformal plan or an IMRT VMAP plan. VMAP plan, all right. Yeah. Right. So you are you are not taking this this question for only for IMRD. Uh, in your department, you are doing daily portal imaging for IMRD. If if the patient has twenty five days, you you are taking twenty five days imaging, or not? Yeah. So in my department, we do MB imaging to verify treatment fields on three D conformal treatment plans on the first yeah. day. And then every five days after that, and uh, then right. for IMRT or VMAT plans, treatment plans, we're doing daily KV imaging mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a cone beam CT on the first day. First day. And then the doctor will determine if they want to do a cone beam CT mm -hmm. daily or yes. once a week or every five days for an IMRT plan. All right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay.
So, okay. I think there is no question. Um, I did see one question earlier um, on fiducials on a prostate patient. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so the question was, I was wondering if you were doing matching on fiducials um, uh -huh. for a prostate patient and then after the cone beam CT. So I'm assuming you're matching to fiducials on a KV or MV image and then you acquire a cone beam CT. Do we pay attention totally to the fiducials um, and disregard the structure surrounding example being gas or bowel or bladder fill um i would say that's going to be dependent on on the doctor on what they deem is um more important right so depending on the dose that's going to change the whether you're really just focusing on fiducials or every or the surrounding structures um and also depending on the treatment technique right so if you have a larger 3d conformal field where you match your fiducials and your bladder fill and rectum filling is not necessarily affecting the dose, but it's going to be within the treatment area, then maybe you take that into account. Um, or if you're using an IMRT technique or VMAP plan, you match to the fiducials, but if there's multiple fiducials, that bladder fill or rectum fill might change the position. Um, so I think it's a combination of, of doing all of those things, right? It's matching to, matching to fiducials at first, but then taking into account surrounding anatomy. Um, but again, that's going to be dependent on the doctor's prescription, um, the dose that they're delivering for that day, um, and then the treatment technique. Great. Is Mr. Rogers, uh, hello. Which yes, card do you represent? Can you repeat your question? Hello, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I don't know the country is working. Where is he working? Can you repeat the question? Your voice is cracking. Didn't quite hear the Mr. question. Amy? Mr. David. Hello, yep. Mr. David. Yep. Where are you working? Working at? Where do I where do I work? That was the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah the place? Oh, I work at UC San Diego in California. California. All right. UC San Diego in California. Great. Okay. Any other questions? So we'll yes, I have a question, please. Please go ahead. Okay, so please um, I want to um find out: is there a need for simulation in the cases of keloid or skin lesions that requires electron treatment? Is there a need for simulations? Um, I would say that's going to be. Um, at the discretion of the doctor the to make that call in my department um, we do we do both so there's some situations where the doctor feels like a simulation a ct simulation is going to be best as far as treatment planning goes and positioning on a, a skin lesion or keloid um, and but then there's scenarios where we do um, what we call a simulation in the treatment room where it's more of a clinical setup, um, visually looking at the area of interest or the skin lesion and the doctor telling us where he wants to treat without doing a CT simulation. So we do both in my department. Um, I would say uh, the depth of the keloid, the skin lesion, if there's potential um, cause for further involvement deeper into the tissue, then that's where that CT simulation is going to come into play. Um, but if a doctor feels confident that it's a very superficial treatment and it's something that could be clinically set up um, without a CT simulation, then that's what we do. Similarly, we also do the same, uh, but in during simulation, we just 
uh, around the copper wire for yep. the, the clearly visually identification in the CT scan. So yep. similarly, we do this practice. Yeah, same. So we definitely okay, wire the okay, area of interest. Good so, question. Yeah. I think there is no question, David. Hello. Hello. Yes, please. Yes, please. How do you do blood irradiation? Or how do you do it? Blood irradiation. Yes, irradiation of blood and blood products. And how do you do it? And what dose do you give? David. So, asking, uh, yes. In my, in, my, in my department, we don't. Um, well, I guess we used to. Uh, we used to do radiation on blood products with our treatment machines um, a few years ago, but um, now there's technology that we have that there's um, self-contained radi yes. radiation units to, to do that type of treatment. So um, that's not something that I have experience with, but I know we used to do it um, a few years ago on our treatment machines. And I, that's really, that's all I know about that. I don't know how they did it, um, but I know that it's, um, there's newer technology that that we use to to do that. Yes, my department we are using the blood radiation. We just make one container is a thirty by thirty field size. We put in the water and all the bags and give the radiation AP and APPA treatment. So around uh, twenty five grain uh, <laughs> we deliver. So generally we are using. <laughs> Um, I see a question here in the chat box. Is how are you matching your SRT brain patients in your department? So we use a um, a line RT, which is our surface guided um, software to listen the patient in the room, and that that also stays on throughout the treatment. So that surface guided software is um, tracking any type of treatment, um, during the treatment. But then we also do a comb um, to verify the treatment area um, then the target. So um, that surface guided uh, software is Align RT that we yeah. use. So Align RT and comb CT for stereotactic. Um, yeah, stereotactic they are doing really well. Is that so I think there is no question, David, in the chat box. I request to all the participants, if you have any question, kindly come forward. You can ask the, the question to the David. Okay, David. So, thank you very much. It was very, very nice presentation. You starting from the point for the introduction of the IGRT, the, all the technical challenges, example in your clinic, like KV imaging and MV imaging, the CBCT. So you explained very, very well and presentation was fabulous. So thank you very much the being with us as a uh, RCC volunteer, as a as educator. So hope you meet again for this same platform. It was very, very nice presentation. And we are uh, participants are more happy with your presentation. And also the those are online in worldwide, in the different country, different time, uh, different uh, scenario, morning, evening, afternoon. So all the participants, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, to successfully with our ninth teaching program in RCC. So welcome to again next week, that is the 10th session of our training, IMRT. Thank you very much, all of you, and hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, David. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. So you guys all learn something, take something away yeah. from me. Yes, yes. Thank you. We'll meet again. Okay. All right. You guys take care. Bye bye. Bye.
Thank you. Happy weekend.